Thank you very much. It's incredibly exciting to be here and to see you all and to see you all prepared to be here on a Tuesday afternoon at four o'clock uh, to talk about economics. It's thrilling and it must be terrifying for the British establishment that there is such curiosity. So I'm really chuffed to be here. Now, I, I had the impression that what Imad wanted me to do was to give you a, a PPE-type lecture in 15 minutes on the international financial galaxy. You know, you want, he wanted a hitchhiker's guide to the financial galaxy, and could I do it in 15 minutes? And that is very, very hard to do. But I did want to start, and I wanted to start with this thing, which is what we understand as money, this coin. This simple coin, this is a 10p piece, as you can see, it's quite small. It's tangible, we touch it. And then there's, I tried to look for a pound coin, but I'm running out of them, and the bank's only given me two pound coins. These are the next thing. And then there's something called 20 pounds, which is, you know, I know that's quite a lot of money. Um, and it feels like quite a lot of money. And that's the kind of money that we deal with on a daily basis. So we don't understand the money of the international financial system. Because when you think about that, You've got to think in terms of numbers, millions. Now, you think about millions when you think about the lottery. You think, oh, I could, I could, just, you know, I could just win three million bucks, and guess what? It could buy me a flat in Hackney somewhere. <laughs> you know? And so we kind of, that's our, our imagining of what is possible. Um, but actually, these guys work in a completely different stratosphere, in, in, a, in, in the galaxy, in the financial galaxy. And I don't know how to convey to you what happens in that galaxy and how much of it is up there. Because actually, they do everything they can possibly do to keep it secret from you. This is not a galaxy that any hitchhiker would be allowed into. Nobody's allowed in there. It's exclusive, and it's exclusive for the banks and the finance sector. But occasionally, the cracks open up in this galaxy, and there's a flash of lightning. I think that's what it is. And we get a glimpse of what's going on. And then this last January, we got a glimpse of what was going on, because guess what? You know, The galaxy started to tremble and shake and shudder, and there was noises coming from offside. Really. And that was about worry about China. Everyone blames China. I won't go into that story. It's got nothing to do with China. China's a victim of this crisis. They blame, I don't know, all kinds of characters, all kinds of, but everybody except the real perpetrators of the crisis in the first instance. But they began to blame the banks. And the focus turned to one particular bank, Deutsche Bank. Now, as we know, Deutsche Bank is a bank, a German bank. And it's, uh, we were told by Mr. Schäuble, who is a close ally of Mr. Varoufakis's here, that, um, that actually we had absolutely nothing to worry about and that Deutsche Bank was, and I quote, rock solid. But I want to tell you something, and I, I have no idea if I can explain this to you within this short period. I want to tell you something about the kind of money the Deutsche Bank deals in. They don't just deal in millions or in billions. They deal in something called trillions. Now, I know that none of you can imagine what a trillion is. You know. A trillion would buy you several flats in Hackney. <laughs> but the point is, it is a lot of dosh, okay? But if you think about Germany, which is a big, powerful country, uh, Germany's annual income, the kind of income it generates of all of the activities going on in Germany, is something like seven trillion, and we're going to use dollars just to even everything out, seven trillion dollars a year. Now, that's a lot of money. It's twice the income of, of the United Kingdom, of Britain. We generate about three trillion dollars a year. The United States, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 17. China, with a billion people, generates no more than $10 trillion a year. And the United States, I think it's about $17 trillion. Now, Deutsche Bank is the bank of Germany, $7 trillion. And Deutsche Bank has exposure to fancy financial derivatives to the tune of, and I looked it up yesterday, in the accounts of the comptroller of the currency, 
uh, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency in the United States, they have exposure to what are effectively gambling debts to the tune of, wait for it, $47 trillion. Now, the whole global income of the world amounts to $70 trillion. So about half of that is what Deutsche Bank is exposed to. Now, if the Germans are generating $7 trillion um, a year, are they going to be able to bail out Deutsche Bank? Pretty sure they won't. And what is this money? What is this $47 trillion? Well, you and I know about debts. We know about someone takes out a loan, signs a contract with a bank, a rate of interest, and has to pay back. And we have a criminal justice system. If you don't honor the contract, you can be bankrupted, you can go to jail even, and you're not going to be forced to pay. But these, these derivatives, this exposure to $47 trillion is not a loan in that sense. There are contracts involved, but not of the same kind as loan contracts. They're actually betting slips. And uh, I work with a guy called Fung, who's sitting here, he's a brilliant guy who worked in, uh, in the Bank of Scotland, he's one of their gamblers, so he's explained it all to me. So if you think about it, it's about, think about what these banks are doing is a bit like what Ladbrokes gets involved in, right? The betting shop, Ladbrokes or Coral or Betfred or whichever those are. Now imagine that Ladbrokes is betting that Man United is going to win the Premier League. And imagine they set this bet at the beginning of the season, okay? And they were pretty damn sure that Man U was going to win the Premier League again this year, okay? So they set odds on that. And then people betted against that. People bet whether or not Man U is going to win or whether they're going to score four goals or who's going to score the goal. There's loads of bets that you can make on it. Now, if Man U does win the Premier League, they'll, they'll earn something like £78 million from that. They'll get a prize of £78 million. But there's £5 billion worth of debts out, sporting debts out on football. £5 billion. So there's millions of people that have taken bets on Man U or on other football games with Ladbrokes and with other betting shops. Now, the thing about that is just imagine this happens. Just imagine Man U doesn't win the Premier League, much against the odds set by Ladbrokes, and they, they realize they're going to make huge losses on the bet. What do they do? They declare bankruptcy. They go bust. What happens to the five billion pounds of betting slips? They're just betting slips out there. Where do they go? How do they get their money back? Ladbrokes is not going to pay them. They're not going to get it back. Now, that's what the 47 trillion is like, okay? 47 trillion of betting slips swirling around in this galaxy, which is the international financial galaxy. The trouble is that, that for the five billion quid, there's thousands, thousands of sports fans that are making those bets. So you split that five billion up amongst thousands, and some people are gonna have big losses, some people are not gonna have such big losses. But for the 47 trillion, there's just four or five or six or seven banks betting with each other. So the losses that can be made in that galaxy, in that stratosphere, can be absolutely, as we call it in economics, systemic. It can bring down the whole damn galaxy and our little planet with it, okay? I just want to give you some idea of this because, you know, this is the type of stuff that goes on in our, our international financial economy, which we don't talk about, which we don't understand, which we leave to men in pinstripe suits working at Deutsche Bank. And we think, especially if we're women, we think, well, that's really complex stuff, you know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a quant. How the hell could I expect, be expected to understand that? You have to understand that because your futures and your children's futures and your security is at stake here. And those guys deliberately do not want you to know about this. Now, when I end, how much time have I got? I've only got halfway through the galaxy. I want to bring us back to the planet. Because here on the planet, in this real world, 
We have constructed this galaxy. This is not made by God, this galaxy. It didn't come out of some kind of dark pool out in the global atmosphere. This is a human construct. So between 1945 and 1971, after we'd had the mad crisis of the 20s and 30s, and we'd had a catastrophic and devastating world war, a, couple of, a few economists sat down at Bretton Woods and they decided they were going to construct a new system which this time was going to be stable. And they were going to be insure, make sure it was going to be stable. It was very interesting about the Bretton Woods Conference, which was held just before the end of the war, which was led by John Maynard Keynes and, and William Dexter White, was that President Roosevelt, who was a great politician and a great Democrat and a strong powerful man with some kind of guts and spine, not unlike Yanis Varoufakis, he, um, he announced that there was not going to be a single banker at the Bretton Woods Conference. One tame banker did slip in, and I don't know how or why, but he worked in the agricultural sector and he wasn't really very important. He was not going to have a single banker at a conference that was going to rebuild the international financial architecture. And as a result of the bankers being absent, we got an architecture called the Bretton Woods system, which lasted for 30 years and which is known in all the economic textbooks as the golden age of economics. And the bankers were pissed off, really fed up. They had been cut out of it. They had been told, we all know that you can create money out of thin air, and I don't want to go into that subject. I'm sure you're all aware of it because you're all smart. But we know that this is not, that money is not a commodity. It's not like gold or silver or oil. It's not limited in its supply. It's, it's, a, it's a social construct. You can create it in conjunction with the borrower, and that gives you an immense power and we want to limit that power, we want to manage that power so that you don't create credit for the purpose of speculation in the financial galaxy. Instead, you create it for productive and income-generating purposes. So from now on, thou shalt not lend for speculation under the Bretton Woods system. Furthermore, we want to have some control over the rate of interest that you charge for this because we think when you can create money out of thin air, when it's an effortless activity, why the hell should you charge for it? And furthermore, if you charge too much for it, you build up debt and it becomes unsustainable and unrepayable. And thirdly, we forbid you to move your money across borders without any restraint. You cannot do that. We want to manage the flow of money across borders so that it doesn't disrupt our exchange rate, so that it doesn't disrupt our interest rates at home, so that we can manage the domestic economy in the interest of the people of that economy democratically. And that's what we did, more or less, for 30 years. And the bankers decided they had to uproot this. They wanted the power to create credit without limit, so they created $47 trillion of credit for, for Deutsche Bank. They wanted to be able to charge any rate of interest they chose to charge. And they wanted to be able to move their money so nobody could tax them, so Google could take their money abroad or Starbucks or whatever. And once they had those three powers, they went bananas. And they created this galaxy. Now, we can bring them back from the stratosphere. We can once again pull them down, subordinate them to the interests of the people and to democratic interests. But first of all, we have to know and understand what they are doing. And that's why this is such a great event. And that's why I'm so glad you're all here. Thank you very much.